Great to be back with you folks. And here is the burning question of the day. What does a heart, a dog, a chicken, and a sunflower have in common? Let's see if connectors can break that mystery. How many of you are going, what in the world is she talking about? Is it possible that all those things could have something to do with the connector? Here's the answer. In the last video, we discussed the simplicity of a connector, meaning that it's that typical balanced. It's a little bit more equal square height to rectangles, yada, yada. I mean, it's a little bit cleaner. One of the things I learned a long time ago, and again, this is, is a credit to Mary Ellen Hopkins, was that there's so much more I can do with connectors that I really can't do with some basic patchwork elements. That would be pictorial things, like you can take connectors and create scenes of people and animals and everything easier than you could if you were working with true um, squares, rectangles, triangles, and so forth. So by playing with just our base units, and connectors, we're going to be able to cover all of those elements of a heart, a dog, a chicken, and a sunflower. Now this particular quilt that, that you're looking at now, we call USA Hearts and Stripes. Did this quilt a long time ago and it lives in a book called Scrappy Patches and More. And you know that often we have made the books a PDF version available, but we have inventory still on this book. So for this pattern, we elected to just simply pull out the one pattern, there are seven in the book, present that one pattern to you as one of your project sheets. But this is such a clear example of how great connectors are and how I can do different work. So here's the heart. It's, a, it's basically a four patch and it's sashed. And one of the things that I love about doing this type of sashing is I started with the top, I put a right side on, then a bottom, then a left. So I'm working in a log cabin fashion for sashing this heart. Now that's arbitrary. If you decide you like your hearts differently, of course you make that adjustment. But the pattern is written for the four patch heart and to assemble the sashing in this order with the top and the right being one width and the bottom and the left being another width. As you look at the picture of this whole quilt, I think it gives a big attraction to the way it views because it's got those that variety of sizes. It's like, gosh, I don't know, how would I do those two connectors because one is a square and one is a rectangle. What I've got to do is have two base rectangles and then squares connectors, then squares and then little square connectors. Let's take this to the sewing machine. So as you look at the elements as they lay on the table, what's of real interest is we're gonna start looking at connectors where they aren't normal size. So they're kind of a weird setup. So these four base elements are gonna be what creates that little heart. And so on the top part of the heart, I have two squares on each one, and so those will equal the little points on the star. Then the bottom is the real quirky unit, which has a rectangle and a smaller square sitting on top of it. Now you know the routine. I've taken the corner and dropped it right on my needle. I have the other corner lined up with my drawn line. You may have a piece of tape, or you may have put a crease in the center. So let's sew that. Now I've sewn the top two elements, let's pick up our bottom element. And so what you wanna be real careful of is that you understand which way this is going to fold. So before you put this unit in, make sure you recheck which way you want the element. And this is the right side of the heart. So I wanna be sure that I sew this way, not this way. So just, just double check yourself when you're trying to reposition. And we go back to the point. And again, I'm lucky enough to be in a cabinet so I could even extend my line. And now, do you see how I'm smack on that line? Now let's close that one. Here 
here we are with those four elements prepared. So I didn't sew these together because I think it'll be easier for you to see it this way and I can talk a little bit about it. I didn't even iron it. So what I've got is my four elements. Well, gosh, that almost looks like a cat. Maybe I could have got a cat in there. Oh, well, okay. So I would sew these two together and I would sew these two together. And here is what I would have. So I would join those two elements and let, let me make this a little bit clearer for you. See how nice those sit in there? Now, when you join these two, one thing I would tell you, this is why I don't press before I sew this unit together. Because when I pick this up, do you see how both seams are going the same way? All I've got to do is flip one and the beauty is you don't even have to remember that because every time you make a heart block, it gets sashed anyhow. So as long as you oppose those, you'll be home free on getting this little fellow pressed flat. So the block, I, I really think this is one of my favorite heart blocks and there's probably 25 choices of how you could do this element. But once you make your blocks, you can determine how many the pattern is written for a a quilt that is the size of the photograph you've seen. One thing I want to show you that I really like after the, it's all done, I love this kind of border because now I've got all those colors that made up all my, my heart blocks. So I'm just going to cut some strips. This is normally referred to as a piano key border, meaning that there's just lots of little rectangles running across it. I love the way this border reads on this and it's easy sewing. And then let's look at the corner. What I really had fun with doing this corner is how did I make those all stay in order? So I did two squares cut with these strips and your pattern is very clear on this and then I sewed through the middle and that's how I got that. So it looks like I mitered it and did a whole bunch of work. And folks, all I did was put two squares together, which is another value of the connector. Yes, I do waste a little bit more, but I will tell you, I have learned that my time is a little bit more important in this than my fabric is. So now we're going to look at, we got a puppy and a dog. Years and years ago, gosh, this had to be close to 20 years ago. Um, that we did a little book called uh, Winter Wonderland and it was all little Christmas things and 99.9% .9 of the book was connectors and it was all pictures and things you could do with connectors. So this little Scotty dog was a full quilt in that and I've since done another one that'll be your project sheet but it's the same mama dog and then we did a little puppy dog for you to go with it. Now, I think this would be the cutest little thing to do. And you could create a mama and have a little puppy along with that, make a little wall quilt or something. And it, I mean, it's just a fun little project, but it also increases the value of your knowledge of how a connector works, breaks down and how I can design with it. I typically work on graph paper when I'm doing anything like this, because one grid on that graph paper to me is an inch. So I can create shapes. I can make ears taller. I can make tails different. I can make feet longer. Once I work on a grid system, so all the designs for that came from working on a grid system. What I'm going to do is show you something. So here's a body and then here is a row that is feet, and then here is a row that has a tail and an ear, and then here is his nose. So let's look at that nose right now. So I did the puppy nose with the connectors being a square laid on a rectangle. And here's another rectangle with a square. There's a seam right there. And that's not an issue at all. But I thought since we talked 3D geese last time, why gosh, look, hello nose could be 3D. So on, on the mama dog, or the big dog, I decided that I would make this a 3D. 
it's a little different than making a true flying geese unit with a 3D, but I still cut my two rectangles the size that the pattern calls for. I have given you the size for making a 3D nose in the little handout for both the, the mama dog and the puppy dog. So let's take a look now at the puppy and how it'll be real obvious when the connector sizes are dramatically different. So let's just look at the top element, which, which is an ear and a tail. So this is what it's going to look like when you get ready to sew it because I have a tiny square connector for the tail and a large connector for the ear. This is where you can play with this and say, I want him to have a bigger tail and a shorter ear. Well, that's up to you because this is arbitrary, but you work off of your base is cut as the pure rectangle and then the connectors are in this case, what's making his tail and his ear. The sewing on this is no different. So I really don't need to sew this because I would just sew across here and I would sew across there, fold back, fold back. Now, when you get your pattern for the puppy or for the dog, we have a dog and a puppy, you'll see that the, the two rectangles, and I've got these so that you can tell that they are different. So there's a rectangle with half of his nose and another rectangle with half of his nose, which would be sewn like this. I'd take the two pieces and I would sew that. But if you look at this, you see how I've made his nose a dimensional? Now we've talked about in the last session, we talked about how to do a 3D goose with two perfect rectangles or two squares and a rectangle. Now let's, let me show you how you would sew his nose with two different size rectangles. So we have the two rectangles that normally, to, to do it like the pattern, you would sew a connector there and a connector here. But if I cut the goose part itself as another rectangle, I follow that same exercise we did last session where these would be two squares lay or two rectangles with this in between them, blah, blah, blah. Right now, what I need to do is fold this rectangle in half because he is the goose and these are the background. So I'm gonna pick that up and sandwich it in between where these two are gonna join. And I've got the raw edges even on the bottom and I have the fold up at the top. Now I'm gonna pick up this rectangle and again, now what I'm doing in essence is making my little sandwich, remember we talked about, with the cheese. And what I have is raw edges even here, fold drop down there, and then this will become my sew line. Now one of the things you wanna bear in mind is let's assume that I sold that right there, then when I open it, that's gonna be my goose. So double check because you could be making it backwards where his nose would be going the other direction. So just plan that. And now I'm gonna to go to the machine. Now, here we are with that sewn unit so you can see this now, when I lay this down right here, there would be that nose. The only thing I did, I just, I didn't eliminate the seam altogether because it lives under the 3D goose, but you can decide whether you want to have your puppies have 3D noses or not. Because otherwise, what I would have done is I would have had one connector laid on one rectangle and another connector laid on another rectangle. Now, just like the heart, anytime I'm doing something that is a design like an animal or an object, other than just triangles, I think you're wise to put a frame around it because see what the frame does is defines the dog. If you don't put that frame around it, you have a hard time knowing where the tail is and the feet are. So make sure that you spend a little bit of time sashing it. The sashing for me is nice when it's the background color, but that's again, 
a personal choice. I made both of these the same, and who knows? I can make the cutest little table topper thing out of that. I can make a pin cushion out of that. I mean, there's just loads of things you can do. And the quilt that you're looking at that has the puppy up in the corner is the, we called it batik barkers because it is made out of batik fabric. So you notice they go in, they go in different directions. If you want all your dogs going in one direction, do it like the pattern. If you want to change direction, make all of your elements or cut all your element bases, lay it down, and then you'll just put the nose and the ears in the opposite position. So play a little bit when you lay those out and that'll help you get your puppy all together. Okay, our next little project sheet is a, a little pattern I call Chicken Little. And I tell you, I've, I even have this in some scrappy quilts. This is the cutest little chicken and I did neglect to tell you on the puppy, we did give you the two sizes, the little dog and the big dog. In this case, this is the largest chicken. You have on the pattern a size for a smaller chicken as well. So depending on how big you want your chickens to be, you've got a choice. Nothing on this needs sewing like it did on the others because everything is true connector. So let's kind of I've got my expensive graphics. You know, I told you guys, when you have to buy all this stuff, it's just not cheap. And I had to do them in different colors. So, you know, I had to buy two packs, a pack of yellow and a pack of blue. Well, anyway, here he goes. So take a look. Here's his beak. These are connectors added on to. There's the frames, the nose. Then here comes the eye. Oh dear, let me show you something on the eye. I love a button for the eye. So I picked a little button. Look how cute that is. So now before, I, I would do this after I was probably done quilting and everything because otherwise you gotta work around that with the needles. So I would probably pick out a cute little button and lay that aside for his for his little eye. It's gonna sew in a row like this. So you got a, the head unit, then you've got background, then you got a body unit, blah, 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 and a little wing. <laughs> now I played around with this. First of all, he looked like he was a bird that got caught in a windstorm because I had his little wing going every which way. And I just tried to keep a color for the wing that kind of looked like the background. If you do this all the same color, then you don't see a defined wing. And here I can't resist showing you this. This is just one of those little connector units, like almost like a little dugout. So I did that one in the same color that I used for my border. Again, like the puppy, I do think you need to sash around this element. And if you want to make this a big quilt, then make a bunch of blocks and make a quilt. The whole idea is Easter is just around the corner. And if you've got little people in your life, I'm telling you, get in your scrap basket, pick this guy out, do the little ditch quilting, and you've got a great little present. That is your third project sheet. This last project that we're going to talk about is the Kelly Lou Sunflower. And this quilt, as you're looking at the quilt, this yellow quilt was a journey for me that started many, many years ago, back in, gosh, the late 80s. Yeah, I think it was the late 80s. I called the quilt Kelly Lou Sunflower. The story about why I named it is in the front of the little leaflet. It's just a little six page leaflet. But I'll tell you how this particular quilt changed my trajectory in this industry. I was at a show, saw the quilt. I just went crazy about it. It was the time period of the fabric and the yellow that lives in this quilt was so eye-catching. I love that era that I fell in love with the quilt, bought the quilt. And at that time, I had been working with Mary Ellen Hopkins and Mary Ellen designed for a fabric company. And anyway, we all got to be buddies and I was showing this quilt and that's the first time I was approached to do a fabric collection. So the very first fabric collection I did a jillion years ago was on the Cali Lou Sunflower Quilt. We recreated all of the fabrics that lived in this quilt. It was one of the first times that it had been done where there were four fabrics that lived on the width of the goods. It was almost like you bought four fat quarters when you bought a yard. So you got four because all of these stars have different colored star points. They have different colored circles. There's, there was a wide variety of fabrics and way too many pieces for us to do each one as a standalone. It also started me on a journey 
I bought every quilt I could find that had that yellow fabric in it. And I renamed them all. So I had a Callie Lou, I had a Terry Lou, I had a Susie Lou, I had a, every quilt that I bought. And I still own about yeah, 25 or 30 of those quilts probably with that name because I was obsessed with that yellow fabric. Anyway, this was way back in the dark ages of patchwork, folks. This pattern is written that you create, as you look at that star, you're creating an eight-pointed star with inset seams, Y seams, la, la, la. That's how we worked back then. And then you applicate the circle over the star points. So it didn't really make any difference if your center of that didn't come together, but that's how it was done. Then many, many, many years later, after I had done everything the hard way, then figured out, okay, wait, I can do this as a connector and I don't have to do this much work. So laying on the table in front of me is how I now make this block as a connector. So what I'm doing is I have the two sections that are a, it kind of looks like a flying goose, but it's not. I make this element, I put that to a center, then I do this, and then I do this. Now, one of the things that, that makes this, I don't care if that center, I don't care what it is, you could have a fabric you hate, and you could put it in there, because when it's all said and done, I come back and put the circle over it. So this simplified immensely the way that I could do this quilt. This is where, I coined the phrase, I think Mary Ellen might have been a, had a hand in that, but she had a hand in about everything I did back then, is it's over-connected, meaning that this is more than a quarter of an inch from here to here. And the reason it has to be that is otherwise the circle would not touch the corner at the same time it did that. So that's why the over-connecting has to be has to be there or I wouldn't be able to get my circle to cut to touch all those points. Let's sew just one of these little units real quick. Normally when we make a, a flying geese unit with the connectors in a rectangle, these are pure size. But in this case, take a look at how this is way more than a quarter of an inch. So this is what I called a over-connected rectangle. So in other words, I've gone up this space extra and and you'll see why when we sew this. This rectangle is not a pure rectangle. He's a stubby rectangle and these then these guys are the same height but they are not the half width. So let's sew this unit so that it looks like that. So what I've got here is this is actually going to be covered with a circle, assuming that I'm going to do the block as the book tells you. But so I have a overconnected, I have four overconnected units, four corner squares and a center square. And that would be my block. And then I'll show you the circle. But I want you to see that the reason we're doing this is this gets a circle on it and it has to come around so this corner and this point to form a 360-degree um, circle can't be the normal quarter inch. So that's where the little magic is on making this easier. As you look at the quilt, you have a choice when you make these little stars. If you make this base something that you like, you don't have to put a circle on them. You just have cute little stars that have a deeper point in there, and, and they work fine. See, here's one that I've already put a circle on. I just kind of fused that circle and put it on there for you to see it. But if I use the same base, I wouldn't even have to put a circle if I didn't want to. But let's look at what one block looks like without its circles. Now, here's a great little tip for you. If you don't like hand applique, which a lot of people don't, you could fuse, you could put a fusible on your strips and you have a template for this, but it's just a 
rectangle, you could go in after you sew all three of these together with my big square. So this is really a big square that lives in this corner. So I would have a plain square here and, and three stars. The first couple I made with this technique, I didn't do my stems until after I had assembled all of this. Well, then it was a pain in the neck, folks. So I've just cut these out with no fusible or anything just to be able to show you this. So I've got two leaves per Cali Lou block. And then I have stem one and then the little short stems like this. I did these the hard way to start with. So I don't have these ready to fuse or anything, but I'm assuming you would. This is the template. I cut this exactly like the template in the book. If you don't want to go in and try to set these in, lay one of your stems on that base before you put your first corner on. If you do that, then the whole time that you're working with it, just put it back there and pin it. Now you can do all of your finished work and you don't have to worry about it. Be careful that when you lay this stem on this base that you do it before you put either corner on. And you're like, why, Kay? Well, let me show you. Here's why. <laughs> See, if I got one corner on and I thought I was real clever, then I laid that stem in there. We'll see how I needed to put the stem down first before I put the first corner on. Because you can't go in and put one corner on and then lay a stem down because it doesn't line up. And it's because this is over connected. So make sure that the stem lays down on the naked rectangle in the proper position. So I cut another stem just to show you. So for this one, these two right here would get done on the base rectangle. I would lay it in position like that, put first square on, second square on. The long one has to be done before you join this row right here. So you're going to have to put a pin here probably, and that can be way longer than it needs to be, and you can trim it later. Let's say you went, oh, that's just confusing, Kay. I don't want to mess with that. If you decide to make all your star blocks first before you do your uh, stems, I would encourage you to use Wonder Under and then you would affix it that way. Because if you're gonna do needle turn applique, you're gonna have to really work like a big dog to get these to turn in there. Now, I like the way that looks because I get a little dimension when I do that. So if, if you're a good hand applicator, you probably would prefer this method than doing it in the beginning. But I would probably fuse it and then I would go back and blanket stitch around it or buttonhole stitch or, or do something around it once you fuse it down. The decisions are, couldn't I just make all these little stars and not even make the Cali Lou block? Yes, you could. But if you want a quilt that looks like the ones behind me, the green one, that's done completely on machine and is totally fused. The embroidery going around those circles on, that, on the green and black quilt is the decorative work after it's been fused down. So depending on your, your machine and what your skill level is, will determine the method that you use to approach this. There is a circle template in the pattern as well as the little leaves, as well as the size of the stems that you cut. A long time ago, I ran across this Helix template. I've owned these for, I know, 30 years, 25 or 30 years. We are gonna give you a link to where if you don't, you can find this large circle template. Now I have a ruler that cuts circles. I have loads and loads of elements. There's nothing I cut a circle with that I like like I do this, and I'll show you why. If I were to take, right now as I'd say, okay, I'm gonna fuse these. Well, then I would, I would draw my circles on my Wonder Under or whatever fusible you've chosen, and the industry has a jillion of those, and you just pick the one you like. I typically use Wonder Under on this, but I, it's just because it's there and I, I have a bolt of it probably. This is the circle that fits that. So I could just simply say, hmm, I like freezer paper and I think I'm gonna do these by hand. So what I would do then is I would just simply draw a circle. There's a perfect circle without the seam allowance. 
Well, you can see this little empty hole over here is where I've cut one and it's this little fella right here. So if I were to go to the iron, I would have fusible on the back. I just, I, I have to talk to you a little bit about an iron. For those of you who follow me, you know that I love the Laura Star iron for the big dog iron, I call it. But this little Panasonic I have used for as many years as I think it's been out. And what I love about it is I could have this on sitting six feet away from me. And I could go, oops, fusing time. And if I had done just freezer paper, the sticky side of this, all I'd have to do is come over. I'm glad the iron's not on because let me show you how fun this is. You could say, hmm, I want that flower right there. Well, there's two or three ways. I could lay my template right there and I could slide that in and draw it on it or I could just draw around it. But when I'm doing the freezer paper, I would simply just cut the freezer paper out and then eyeball it and lay it down there. But if you fuse this, you could fuse a whole sheet like this and then cut your circles. All you'd have to do is go, ooh, I want those leaves in my circle. Ooh, I want that in my circle. And then you have way more flexibility than you do if you're working the hard way. When I'm going to hand applique, I almost always use freezer paper, put it down there and that freezer paper will stick. And I mean, it'll stick more than once, folks. So the freezer paper then, I would eyeball a little bit of a seam allowance out there and freeform cut that then needle turn. So whether you're using freezer paper or wonder under, the method of how you do it is up to you. I just wanted to be able to show you the little Panasonic iron because I think it, it's not as cheap as one you might go pick up at a discount store or something like that, but it's certainly not priced like the high end. And what I love about it is when I'm doing this kind of work, I can leave it plugged in over on the counter, pick it up because it's cordless, bring it back over to my work, take it back to the iron, and I don't have all that clutter around me. So the method, when you decide to complete your Cali Lou Sunflower block, you've got quite a few choices of what you're going to do. Are you going to put a solid um, center circle? Are you gonna try to fussy cut and go in and, and come up with one of those? That's, that's just gonna be the decision every quilt maker faces when they're designing. So the Cali Lou Sunflower Quilt, the pattern, the little cheat sheet for how to do this with the connector method is included in the PDF of the Cali Lou Sunflower. So the package deal and all of this will be clear in the details below. Now let's have a little housekeeping, folks. If you like what you see, we'd sure love it if you would subscribe. If you subscribe and click that bell, it means the minute that a video posts, you will be notified. You aren't inundated, we aren't calling you, we aren't sending you like we're gonna re-roof your house or something like that. It lets us continue doing this for you. We encourage you to just watch it. Whether you choose to buy the projects or not, it's completely up to you. We want to know that what you're seeing is valuable to you, and the only way we know that is if you subscribe. We'll keep working at trying to do chickens or dogs or geese or something. We'll try to make it fun for you. So subscribe, do that, click that little bell, and you will know everything that we're up to. Well, everything that's legal that we're up to. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.